Hey, Pastor Steve Waldron here. I just got an email from a viewer and he said, could you do a video that answers these three things? These three things. He says he runs into this all the time. And he says, this is like the top three questions when it comes to Bible versions and the King James version um, specifically. So I'm like, yeah, I can do this. So, uh, italicized words did the king james translators add to the word of god by using italicized words no when you translate from one language to another just to give understanding there's times that you will have to add a word or a phrase to make understanding in that language what the king and every english translation does this the honesty of the King James translators is they put those words that were not found in the original text in italics. So, no, it is just translating from one language to another. They did not add to take away from the word of God. They just put certain words in italics so you would know that those words were not in the original. And believe it or not, I mean, people make this huge deal out of this. When you read through the King James, I mean, so little of it is in italics. As a matter of fact, I just randomly opened my Bible and I randomly opened it, Jeremiah 33. You guys saw it. So let me just start reading here and I'm going to tell you when I hit my first italicized word. I'm going to start in uh, where verse 6. Let's do 33, 6. Okay, behold, I will bring it health and cure and I will cure them and reveal unto them the abundance of peace and, peace and truth. Verse 7, and I will cause the captivity of Judah and the captivity of Israel to return and will build them as at the, at the first. Verse 8, and I will cleanse them from all their iniquity whereby they have sinned against me and I will pardon all their iniquities whereby they have sinned and whereby they have transgressed against me. Verse 9, and it shall be to me, I haven't written across an italicized word yet, a name of joy, a praise, and an honor before all the nations of the earth which shall hear all the good that I do unto them and they shall fear and tremble for all the good and for all the prosperity that I procure unto it. Thus saith the Lord, verse 10, again there shall be heard in this place which you say shall be, shall be is in italics. That's the first uh, italicized words. There's none in the remainder of verse 10. Um, in verse 11, which is a very long verse, uh, towards the uh, end of the middle endureth and and is italicized. So I mean it's you're not talking about italicized words every verse. Um, it's they're barely there and they're just there to have an understanding to make English and it's what if you were reading in Greek or reading in Hebrew or reading in Aramaic it's what you would read there. So as you're reading in Hebrew, Greek, and Aramaic, as you're reading that, or Hebrew and Aramaic going this way, as you're reading that, that's what you would read in your understanding. So no, the King James translators did not add to Scripture with italicized words. All translations do this basic, and I say all, I'm thinking of like J.P. Green's uh, interlinear or something, maybe didn't, or Ricker Berry's interlinear translation. Um, but let's say all the major ones do, and it is for understanding. Now, I used to only read like Ricker Berry and J.P. Green because I just wanted, but it's just everything is convoluted. There's words out of out of order. So no, they did not add to the Word of God. This is how, if you're reading Hebrew and Greek, this is how you would read it. All right, so secondly, that's first, then Sinaiticus and Vaticanus manuscripts, though possibly older, doesn't mean they're accurate. There are only two out of 6,000 that have shorter readings. And the thing you get into there is like Bergan did an amazing job comparing Sinaiticus and Vaticanus that they disagree several thousands of times in the Gospels alone. They are not some monolithic uh, Alexandrian reading uh, 
And that's the reason on the revised version committee, Westcott and Hort said, so when we basically are going to take Vaticanus, which they called Codex B, as the, the face value. So not only in cutting edge scholarship, now Sinaiticus and Vaticanus are almost totally proven purportedly to be frauds. They're not ancient documents. It just didn't happen. But even if they were, oldest is not always best. I just did a video on this. A Scrivener made this quote saying that it's counterintuitive, but it's true. Even Allen, Kurt and Barbara Allen, says this, that um, who's head of, you know, in Munster, Germany, of the Biblical Society for Biblical Studies, that just because you have an old document doesn't mean it's right. I mean, because a lot of times older documents, if they were wrong or mistranslated or translated by heretics, nobody used them. So, of course, they remained in perfect preservation state. Whereas you would have original autographs that would be used and worn down to a frazzle and they would have lines of truth in them. Uh, minuscule and majuscule unsealed lines of truth in them a manuscript tradition so we may have a 13th century manuscript that has been accurately copied from the original autographs through many generations and it's perfect or very near perfect and you may have something that's a thousand years older that's a pile of garbage and all biblical scholars know this all people who study papyrus and biblical manuscripts so to say oldest is best that is that's just a talking point but when you dig down when you unpack that that is definitely not true you have something from the 10th century and this is the reason almost all the minuscule manuscripts are when I say virtually identical, there may be jots and tittles out of place or a letter out of place every so often, but they're basically the same because they were coming from the original autographs and everybody knew. And the reason that you have Alex Drynus, Washingtonius, Bizet, Codex Ephraimus, Rescriptus, uh, Sinaiticus, and uh, Vaticanus, they don't agree amongst themselves. They are totally contradictory amongst themselves. And we're finding out now some of the papyrus is probably forgery as well as Sinaiticus and Vaticanus. Sinaiticus and Vaticanus. So, and people watch like well, look, you have to be very careful with well presented error. And uh, so people watch videos, well, this guy presented it better than David Daniels. Well, David Daniels was a Bible translator from the 1980s. I mean, he's done Bible translation work. Now he's a King James guy. And uh, anyhow, a lot of people like that. Okay, so the third thing is, is we know Hebrew and Greek better than the King James translators. No, that is definitely not true. First of all, they were building, the Reformation was sola scriptura, it was built on the Bible. And so since most of the subjects in the kingdom were supposed to be some type of Christian, they built their entire societies on the Bible. So the, the Catholics did is they said your Bible's got errors in it. And so you have to have us, the church and tradition, as infallible interpreters of the Bible. So what it did in practicality is it put tradition ahead of the Bible, ahead of Scripture. And so you, you have this. And so what Queen Elizabeth did is she endowed professorships, they're called Regis professorships, of biblical languages, Greek and Hebrew, at the various colleges like Westminster, Oxford, Cambridge. And so because they knew to fight against that charge that they were going to have to come up with a perfect Bible. And so they would dedicate their lives. I'll give you one example, like John Boyce was English, he was British. By the time he was five, he had already read the New Testament, not the Old Testament, the New Testament through in Hebrew. And then, by the time he was 12, he went to college. And if you read Boyce's notes and Andrew Downs, who was Regis professor there for over 40 years, they would start many times at 4 a.m. in the morning and read all extant 
Greek manuscripts, whether it was early church writers or so-called early church writers, whether it was Attic, Homeric, they read every type Koine Greek from 4 a.m. to 8 p.m. in the evening with no cell phones, no breaks. Their minds were just different. That's the reason they could get up and preach six hours and everybody. I remember one of the King James translators who preached like 11 years on the book of Jonah. And one time after, I think it was two hours, it may have been four, but two hours, he said, well, that I be not further tedious unto you. They, they said the whole congregation in unison stood up and said, for God's sake, man, continue on. They didn't want it to quit. The Lincoln-Douglas debates were six hours and people just sat there because their attention spans were different. They could read a book. This is proven. <laughs> and like they could then quote the book verbatim back to you seven and eight pages. These are just commoners. These are not learned people doing. This is just somebody that had uh, learned to read and would read something from Spencer or Shakespeare or something and they would just read because their, their attention spans were totally uncluttered. And so they knew Hebrew and Greek, studying it for decades at the time, reading all extent, far, far better. Because think about how does somebody learn Hebrew and Greek today? Well, usually not even in high school. Usually they get to college and they'll take a Greek class and then they'll want to be a theologian. So then they'll study three years of Greek to get an advanced degree. And then sometimes while they're doing everything else, one of their classes may be a Greek class, for example, or a Hebrew class. In the whole compass of their life, 168 hours in a week, they may be given two or three hours to this. And once they do that for about eight years, they are considered a scholar world class. So no, there's no comparison, they're pygmies objectively studied versus the King James translators. Also, the King James translators uh, knew that they could translate the words into more, that there were synonyms. And so they did not slavishly translate one word verbatim every time because they knew the Bible was going to take over the world, the English-speaking world, and they, they even said, and the translators of the reader, we didn't want certain words to fall out of circulation. So they would use synonymous words, and that is the biggest nothing burger in the world. That every time you see a Greek word translate, it has to be translated identically. Context determines translation, first of all. And so you won't do it uh, slavishly based on context. But second of all, even if the context is demands a similar word, you can use a synonym. But it was still totally accurate because their goal was to have a perfect Bible. They said that was their goal. To be a Bible not justly objected against. And so they got the goal. They did it. So that's those three. Uh, you might want to Put your comments, but please put learn comments. Don't don't like read um, Geisler and Nix and what your seminary says, and just write this propaganda that's error perpetuated. Give it some thought. Give it some prayer, and write something that's halfway germane. And please don't write anything if you haven't watched the video. Because so many of the things I try to answer is people that don't even watch the videos. They see the name and say, you're a KJVO and blah, blah, and just begin to spout party lines. And it has nothing to do with truth at all. So I love you. God bless. Talk with you later in Jesus name.